Hello, welcome to Love Rugby League Towers with me, James Gordon. I'm joined by Drew Derbyshire. We've had our pizza for lunch, so we're here now for slightly later than usual Rugby League lunch hour. Um, we're going to talk about a few things as usual. Drew, please do uh, leave your comments and if there's any um, anything you want us to debate, please do leave them in the comments and we'll, we'll try and reply to you and, and talk about it on camera. Um, We've had a few. We've got a few uh, housekeeping bits that we have to tell you. We've got a competition with Bachelors uh, running on the site at the moment. They're giving away a Bachelors rugby ball and a tin of mushy peas. Is it one tin? Is it multiple tins? It might be multiple. Might be multiple, multiple tins of mushy peas. So um, if you go on the on the win section of the website, you can enter that. There's a winner every week at the moment, so we're told. Um, thanks also to Betfred for their continued support of the site and the podcast. And uh, and also we've got one here. We've got a load of um, state of mind face masks that are available. Ten pound. Ten pound, apparently. Yeah, you can get yeah, them on I'm state sure. of mind on the state of mind website, and then uh, we'll do do our best to get them to you from here. They're all all in. we've got hundreds here in our office. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you want one of them, go on the state of mind website. Uh, just before we came online, Drew, um, we just put a story up on the site and um, with some RFL comment about the return of fans. So last night there was a um, a statement from the government uh, that basically with a list of pilot events across a, a number of sports for September, the sports were football, basketball, cricket, rugby union, speedway, horse racing. But rugby league wasn't on the list. Um, I've managed to speak to someone from the RFL this morning and here is what they had to say. Um, Super League, well, rugby, the RFL is still hopeful that the 30th of September round of Super League could be included in the pilot. So that's when they're aiming to get fans potentially back to Super League games. That's the 30th of September. The 30th of September is a Wednesday night, just so you can put that in your diary. Um, now, we don't know a great deal about how it would work, but I would imagine based on other sports, it would be very limited capacity. Um, so looking at football, non-league football at the moment are operating at around about 15% capacity um, and obviously there'll be all sorts of measures in place, social distancing, um, it, the, the bit, because I know people say it, people say all the time about, well it's a 20,000 seat stadium and there's only six, 7,000 fans in there, but the issue with the Covid requirements from the government is the crowding element, so you know like when people are going in and out of the ground. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, what are your thoughts on, on getting the fans back? Well, it's, it's a good thing, isn't it? Uh, I think we've all missed the action. Uh, we, we've not been able to go to some of the games as well because they're only letting a certain number of media in as well, James. We've struggled with uh, accreditation a couple of times. Um, but it would be good to have some fans back, even if it's in a small portion. Hopefully, um, they can sort it in a manner where like what they've done in the, the NRL where maybe 500 members get to go one week and then another 500 and they'll do it in like a ballot format kind of thing mm. or they'll just take, take it in terms of the fans it'll just be good to get the fans back in the ground I, I, I don't think anyone considering what the, the last four or five five um, months have been like that we expect a full capacity um, but, yeah. but Hopefully, a couple of thousand fans at grounds, individual individual grounds as well. So games aren't. Yeah, no, so, so, so the, the the reason for the pilots is they're hoping that these pilot events in September, with the view to allowing more fans back across the board from October the first. So the RFL said October first is the government's ultimate milestone, but season ticket holders and broadcasting commercial partners who have shown immense forbearance and goodwill would not wish to lose an opportunity to have spectators at games for the sake of a few hours. Um, the RFL is saying that that round of fixtures benefits the wider sports sector as a set of pilot events. It adds to the pilot program with a full round of fixtures as per a standard sporting calendar that would be a significant learning for both operational colleagues in stadium and in managing logistics remotely. Um, the games currently scheduled for that round, so these are potentially the games, the first games that you can get fans back. When we say the first games, of course, Catalan are allowed fans in France, which is a different kettle of fish, but First fans back in the UK. The games would be Wigan against St. Helens, um, Castleford against Hull, Leeds against Catalan, Salford against Warrington, and Huddersfield against Hull KR. Um, I mean, you'd imagine there'd be quite a scramble for a ballot for Wigan against St. Helens. 
Yeah, uh, I think you, you couldn't really pick uh, a more high-profile match uh, than Wigan Saints, uh, especially when everyone we, we've not had a derby game for for quite a while as well, uh, for what it seems like anyway. Um, but I, I'm just looking forward to hopefully getting a couple of thousand fans back, hopefully a couple of thousand Wigan, a couple of thousand Saints. Uh, the rest can watch it on telly. There'll, there'll still be a little bit of uh, excitement and a bit of a buzz about about the game. And to be fair, I know we're, we're fans as well as, as journalists, and we missed it. We missed the interaction with with everyone. But think about the players feel. How do the players feel playing in an empty stadium? But yet they've still got to get themselves up for the game every single week. They've still got to perform at the highest level. But there's literally no atmosphere. They can. They can just hear themselves talking to each other. Uh, it must be such a strange feeling for the players. There's obviously the, the financial element as well for clubs. You'll obviously be. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they do it because if you've if you've had a season ticket for this season and you've asked for it to be refunded, I presume that then means you won't be able to go to the games or you won't qualify for games maybe. Mm. Um, but we'll see how that pans out. Yeah. Obviously, we we spoke to the RFL and that's what they've come back with. So um, we've got a couple of comments already. Uh, Louis Bank says, "Good to see you back, guys." I know Louis tweeted me. Uh, I think it was at some point last week, and he was asking about no more Thursday uh, live shows. But we we have recently just got back into the office, uh, Louis. So we we will try and, and make it a weekly thing uh, from now on. Uh, we're getting a couple more comments. Andy Lawson says, "Do you think that fans will be able to go into Wembley for the Challenge Cup final?" Well, it's not even been confirmed the Challenge Cup final is at Wembley this year, has it? Um, because obviously the dates move. Right? I think is it's it October nineteenth. Yeah, it's half hour seventeenth, maybe. Maybe it's Saturday, won't it? Let me have a look. October seventeenth, maybe nineteenth. Um, it's not been confirmed at no, Wembley yeah, 17th, now. You're right. um, yeah, I mean, you'd imagine that. I mean, obviously, the reason why the Challenge Cup final was put back that late was to try and, you know, try and get fans in there. Obviously, Wembley holds 90,000, so even if you got 15% of 90,000, you know, it's probably still worthwhile doing because, well, what's 15% of 90,000? About 14,000. Yeah. 14, but you'd imagine by the time they get to, I guess, because the situation's changing, I mean, that's still six, seven weeks away. By the time that potential Wembley final comes along, you might it might be they might be permitting thirty thousand yeah. to go in, which then makes it uh, worthwhile. Just a, a few a few of the words what they're saying in terms of the so the events are all about demonstrating that fans can return in a manner that will limit the spread of COVID, which includes social distancing, limited crowding points, which is what I mentioned, controlled bookings and seating arrangements. So I think having like reserved seats and um, you know space between seats is very important. Um, obviously capacity restrictions as we say and then everyone in the ground has to do the NHS test and trace um, which of course you know if you think if there's 10,000 people coming into a venue you know capturing 10,000 people's information for mm. instance is, is, you know that's a pretty time consuming um, time consuming job uh, Mike Malone says we've been saying it will be a massive crowd well we wish it would be a massive crowd, but uh, I can't see it being an 18,000. Well, it'll be, like uh, I say, uh, I mean, I mean, we're, be... we're only basing it on, on football, the comparison with football. So football is allowed 15%, which to be fair, it goes up to 30% after um, September the 1st. So 30% of Wigan's capacity is, is what, about seven, 8,000? So, you know, if you could get to that point, you know, by the end of September where they're allowing 30%, actually 8,000 in, in Wiggins, you know, in, in the Wigan ground might not actually too bad. Well, it would be interesting how they split it, because I presume they'd have to give an allocation yeah. to St. Helens. Ob obviously, we're, we're going to say it's a massive game, uh, and, it, and whenever they've played at the DW, you, you're more than likely to get over 20, yeah. 21, 22,000. Um, but when you, when you play... Uh, Wakefield, for example, uh, so it, if it's Wigan Wakefield or Wigan Huddersfield or whoever, so one of the Yorkshire teams that were coming over, I, th I think there's only around 11, 12,000 in the ground, maybe 11,000 in the ground at the time anyway, so if, if you could get 8,000 in, it wouldn't be too big of a difference really from where you were, uh, yeah. from, from them sort of games. It's, it's, it's the bigger game, isn't it? The Wigan Warriors yeah, and Wigan Leeds. The other interesting the point... Same. The other interesting point, and I suppose one of the worries, is that how many people have been put off from going to games now? You know, are we going to, is rugby league going to have lost a percentage of match going fans because they've either, 
you know, the Irish don't want to go or they've found other things to do with their time or whatever. It'd be interesting to see how that comes out. The Wednesday night factor as well, you know, all the kids will be back in school by then, so it's like, you know, there's no guarantee that the win game would be on a Wednesday night, I should point that yeah. out. The, the idea is that the round starts on a Wednesday night, so you'd imagine they'll be, you know, they might have one, you know, imagine they might put a big game, maybe we can say it's on a Wednesday night, then they put maybe two on a Thursday, two on a Friday, whatever. Um, it'd be interesting to see how they, how they work it all out. Thanks to everyone tuning in as well uh, at the moment. If you want us to discuss anything at all, uh, squads, players, games, uh, the current situation regarding coronavirus in Super League, just let us know. Drop a, a comment in the comment box uh, and we'll try and get three questions and uh, answer them. We're getting quite a lot of uh, listeners in uh, and viewers as well, so we always appreciate that. Let's talk about the coronavirus situation then. So obviously last weekend there was a quiet one, so there was just the one game. Um, it broke early this week and it was three Catalan players that tested positive. Um, and obviously that meant that their game was postponed um, this weekend. They were meant to be playing Wigan. Um, obviously Wigan play Cat Castleford now. Um, what, what do you make of that situation? Because, it, it, you know, with everything that we've heard about coronavirus over, over all this time, it seems unusual or it seems strange to think about, well, if three Catalan players have got it, how can the Wakefield players have avoided it? But then at the same time, you know, Hull had nine players and somehow yeah. none of the Salford players got it. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't really, you know, especially when you're saying, you know, we're walking around shops with masks on and yet these blokes who are sort of playing rugby aren't passing it on to each other. Yeah, uh, I, I find it strange. I, I, I really couldn't tell you how they did the the tracing for the Wakefield players, it'd be interesting to to, to find out why. Um, I think they mentioned that Opta were involved in some way, so whether there was, vid there was so, video analysis or well, something. So would one of them Wakefield players would have had to make 10 more tackles on one of the players, I, I the think Catalan it, players who have tested positive for it? Or? It was something to do, it's something to do with face-to-face -face contact okay. over a certain period of time, I think. So I think what they're looking at in the videos is um, how much face-to-face -face contact or within, I think it's within a metre or within so, so much have them two players been. Um, I mean, fair, you know, you've got, to, you've got to probably tip your hat to Wakefield as well, because don't forget, they're yeah. probably going to be players down this weekend. They, you know, in a normal situation, if you have players taken off your hands mm. through no fault of your own, um, you would probably be within your right to say, well, hang on, we want to call this match off. But Wakefield are sort of appreciative of the, the situation. Don't want to. I think I think clubs just want to play, don't they? Mm. Uh, I don't think they're too the too fussed about resting players. Obviously, the factor of there being no relegation this year that is a lot of pressure on clubs uh, down know. at the bottom uh, end of the Super League table. So that's relieved a lot of pressure. So maybe if there were relegation, clubs at, at the lower end would. Um, uh, you, 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 you do sort of get worried about playing games without the main players, but. Fair play to Wakefield, they've, they've put their hands up and, and they, I'm not saying they're taking one for the team, but they're doing, they're doing yeah, a bit, yeah, aren't they? They're contributing. I think I've seen Adrian, so Lam Adrian Lamb said something in there this week where he said there was sort of an agreement between all the clubs that, that you know, if, if, if fixtures had to change or stuff had to change, that they'd just sort of suck it up and get on with it. Um, I suppose it is interesting, actually. You wonder whether, is there an attitude where... As much as the clubs want to win and they want to, you know, as much as there will be clubs who want to win Super League, it's more about they want to try and get the season over and done with so that they can, you know, obviously there's a lot of desperation and a lot of pressure regarding the, the, the broadcast money and, and the commercial money, whereas I suppose they're hoping that once they see through this season, next season will hopefully be a bit more normal. Yeah. Um, you know, whereas I guess they're on a bit of, I guess it must be very... Um, Worrying sometimes whether on pins because they're thinking, well, if there's another outbreak, you know, especially that whole one happened, what was it, two weeks in? It's like if there's more outbreaks of that and we have to stop playing, that might cost us millions. Yeah. You know, and there's, a, there's a bit of worry there, isn't there, I guess? Uh, we've got another comment, uh, I think it's from yeah, Andy Lawson again. I'm a Wigan season ticket holder who lives in Birmingham uh, and I'm, I would still want to attend matches. I mean, obviously, we'll have to wait and see what the clubs come out with. Like you say, you'd imagine. They'd have to do some sort of ballot process, um, you know, where people express their desire to go. It'd be interesting to see how that's managed because does that mean a ticket sent? You know, are you going to end up with tickets going on the black market if you want? You know, like if they've only got five thousand tickets and 
there's obviously going to be more demand. Are we going to see a bit of, you know, is we going to see something maybe that you, you wouldn't want to see people selling tickets on and stuff like that? I'd be interested to see if that, um, if that happens. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see what the clubs, obviously the clubs are obviously working towards something in the background. Um, like I say, with the whole season ticket thing, I think that's interesting because, you know, I know not all the clubs have done that, but the clubs that, um, the clubs that, have refunded season tickets or you know people who claim you know they presumably won't be permitted to go what if you forgo your season ticket for this season are you yeah. still able to go you know there's a, there's a few questions which individual clubs will have to um will have to answer of course uh, looking ahead to the weekend uh, obviously there was no games last week so there was no well, apart from the one so there's there's not really much to talk about in terms of what happened last weekend um, Wigan Castleford is the first game on Saturday, um, and then Leeds Salford. All the games at, at Warrington this weekend, and then on Sunday it's Hull, KR, St Helens, Huddersfield, Hull, Warrington, Wakefield. Um, Castleford did all right against, played well against St Helens. Obviously got beat ten nil. Wigan, is it is it Saints or Wigan? Do you think for the for the league this year? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say so. Uh, I'd say it's one of them two. I'd, I'd probably. Leading towards St. Helens at the minute, to be honest. I, whenever I've watched them since the, the restart, they've been red hot, um, especially with forward and attack. Both edges have been clinical for Saints. Um, but Wigan are grinding games out like they always do as well. Um, they've not won convincingly in some games like St. Helens have, but Wigan are renowned for grinding games out and grinding the two points out, and that's what they've been doing. I've been impressed with the Wigan drum kids uh, through the middle. I, I thought they were growing every week. Well, I mean, I they're mean, standing up to the test. The, the bullying um, forwards were five or six, eight years older than. As, um, as well as the big, impressive. as well as the big lads as well. You've got Harry Smith, haven't you? You know, probably the the. If we were in a normal season, yeah, I'd imagine there'd be a lot of chatter about Harry Smith. Uh, you know, you're potentially looking at him being young player of the year already. I think you know because yeah. the way he's been able to come in, he's almost. You, at the start of the season, you wouldn't have been thinking, you know, you knew he was on the fringes, but you wouldn't have expected him to maybe have as important part as he has had in, in what Wigan have done already. Yeah, he's a, he's a, spe he's a special player. I, I watched him a couple of times, well, more than a couple of times in the under 19s at Wigan, and you could, you could tell when he was like 17 that he was going to be a special player. I just like the way he organised his play. Uh, he plays with a, a wise head on young shoulders. Uh, he's got a massive future in the game, and I think he'll be in Wigan's first team for. For years to come, he's, and he's got a, a nice uh, kicking game as well. And I mean, in some ways, and there's always a lot of chat about Hastings and you know Jackson Hastings. To me now, if you're Wigan, I'd rather lose Jackson Hastings than lose Harry Smith. Mm. I think that's what my position would be on it. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. well if it, the way Harry Smith's going, he could be at Wigan for mm. the next ten years, couldn't he? He could, he could be at Wigan all his career if, it, yeah. if, if he carries on uh, the way he is going. Um, that's that for uh, we can cast four fifteen on on Saturday. And we've had a piece with Gareth O'Brien on the site this morning where he's hoping to um, help Casper to another grand final. Um, Casper haven't quite got going yet, but played all right against St Helens. I've been impressed with Danny Richardson at Castleford this year. Uh, I think he's really stood up to the test. He's taken on uh, a big role alongside Jake Truman at the Tigers, um, but there was a lot of hype around them in pre-season, wasn't there? Truman and Richardson, two, they, two of arguably the, the country's most talented halfbacks. They uh, probably suffered because they were actually they'd actually started fairly solidly, hadn't they, Casper? And obviously with the lockdown, yeah. they've not they've just not got going again, perhaps as quickly as they were. But wanted I, I, to. I think they'll come good. I think I think they'll cut, they'll finish up strong, and, and who knows? They could they could potentially reach the grand final. Um, it, it all depends how, yeah. how, how the span of, of cast players. One team, uh, did, so that's 4 15 Saturday. Saturday at 6 30 is Leeds versus Salford. Now, Salford will probably be gutted about, I mean, I mean, obviously, he'll be gutted about a, a coronavirus situation, but I guess for Salford, they'll have been gutted to have lost that game that they had postponed. They then had to have another week off, you know, obviously, there's no cup games. Because if you look at Salford's results either side of the lockdown, they've, they've pulled off a couple of really eye-catching wins um, that suggest that potentially if they were able to string a bit of a run together that they could maybe even replicate what they did last season. Yeah, uh, they, 
they always come up with it with surprise results, Salford. I don't think anyone expects Salford to do as well as they do every single year. Um, Ian Watson, everyone knows, is a, a very uh, talented coach. He does great with the budget that he's got at Salford. Um, and I think they, they could potentially, I'm not saying they could make. Well, I've got, I've got a bet, we'll talk about this, I've got a bet, we've got Salford sponsoring one of the offices ne uh, next door to us, and I've got a bet with him, this probably won't adhere me to um, any Salford fans, but we've got a bet, I've, he's bet that Salford are finishing top half, and I've said Salford are finishing the bottom half. Yeah, I, uh, think, I think they'll finish top half. I think the, the thing is, is, I don't know whether I'll be able to pull off it, is it null and void, because Toronto have pulled out, I can't remember whether I, th I thought <laughs> Toronto might finish above them, um, so we'll see how that goes, but... Uh, Slowly but surely, though, I don't, I don't think they'll win any trophies this year. Um, I do think they are improving under Richard Agar. Um, they are a better team than they have been in recent years. I think Luke Gale has been a good addition to the Rhinos, but I just can't. I, I don't think they've got enough, enough in the tank to, to that, pick up some silverware just yet. I mean that. I, I, how much do you think is you know let's just the Huddersfield game where they were pretty much they were they were easily second best for you know sixty five minutes you know that game they managed to pull it off everyone was really excited then they got absolutely snotted by St Helens and they were pretty comfortably beaten by by Wigan weren't they mm. um, you know you, you sort of wonder are they going to be? Are they going to just be inconsistent? Maybe um, too inconsistent to actually make the playoffs. Um, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I probably agree. You don't know. Um, well, uh, Sunday's games are Hull KR against Saint Helens. So Hull KR had a bit of bad news, I suppose, this week in terms of Neil Hutchell um, saying that he's going to be stepping down, if that's the right word, yeah. um, from his chairmanship and relinquishing his ownership I suppose if they can find someone to take it on. Um, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people on Twitter and stuff who are very easy to criticise but I think I tweeted something, um, if you look at where Hulk KR were 16, 17 years ago, you know, they got promoted to Super League in the right way, they established themselves in Super League, they've improved facilities, they've brought through young players, they've improved the crowds, you know, if every club would have done that over that time, then you know the game would be in a, in a much in a much better place. So, for me, I, I think sometimes criticism of, of, of certain individuals is unfounded. I, um, I think he's done a great job at Hull KR. Yeah. Um, they, they've built themselves into a, a sustainable Super League club, a solid Super League club with a great fan base. And even when they, they were relegated to the Championship a couple of years ago, they kept. Uh, the majority of the fans, they kept the majority of the team to kill was, uh, I, I think they've done a great job on and off the field over, over the last ten years. Yeah, and I think that I think that's the key point is like I I say this all the time. There seems to be this clamour that people want perfect clubs from perfect locations, playing in front of perfect crowds with perfect owners and perfect grounds and whatever. And it's like ultimately you can't. That doesn't happen overnight. And ultimately, from where you know, Hull KR fans will know better than us, no doubt, but. You know, from where okay, I were maybe in the late 90s and early 2000s, for them to be at the top table. And of course, people say, well, look, once you're at the top table, everyone just votes to protect themselves. But is that their, is that those individual clubs' fault? That's just the, the nature of the beast at the moment. Uh, but the interesting thing with OKR okay, since the restart is Tony Smith seems to be a bit blase about results, and he's just sort of saying about well, that, it about well, it. That, that, that's the other thing about non-relegation. Uh, I think he made a comment a couple of weeks ago after they lost to Warrington. It was heavy. I mean, it was heavy. Well, it, yeah, they started well and then it, it turned out to be a heavy defeat. But Hulk yeah, threw the ball around quite a lot. They, they did test Warrington. But after the game, he, I think he's, he was mentioning that it's good that we have no relegation because it means teams can play expansive rugby now rather than mm. safe rugby. I don't know if, if everyone. Have, not everyone will agree with that um, because you should be you should be trying to win you should be trying to get as many points as you can yeah, on, the, I mean, on the on the in the table, but I can also see where he's coming from in the sense that it's not just five five drives because drives. Yeah, I mean, on. there's no yeah, of course, there's no pressure on. Oh, you're not you're not 
you're not losing. But then at the same time, I think that's probably the wrong attitude to have. I mean, yeah, obviously it's an entertainment business if you like, but it's sport and you should be doing whatever it takes to win. And you, there's no reason why you can't win playing expansive rugby just, just, as, it, just as if you win playing five drives and a kick. I think you need to... Sport always has to have that contest. It's all right, bulky out, chucking the ball out, of, you know, a bit. But if they're losing by forty points every week, is that what people really want to, you know, is that what people really yeah. want to see? You know, I'm not sure it is. Uh, so that's Sunday at one. Um, Huddersfield Hull is Sunday at four fifteen. I feel really sorry for Huddersfield because they've lost two games by one point. Uh, yeah, um, you know, if, if a point either way. They'd have four more points in the table. I think they'd probably be joint top would be in the in the league table. Um, and although they've not got they've not got loads of talent, uh, they've not got loads of big names on paper. Just feel obviously you've got Aiden Caesar and you know Jermaine McGilvery and stuff. But really interesting how how Simon Walker's put that team, put his own stamp on that team, and um, a nice mix of players that they have brought through themselves, players they recruit from other clubs. Um, I, I quite like the look of the Giants at the moment. Yeah, they're, they're... The academy's improved a lot over the last couple of years, hasn't it? Over the last five or six years, I think. Uh, they've started to bring through a lot more of their own talent instead of going out to... They pinched a few from Bradford, we have to say, when Bradford was struggling, so like, they did, they still, and this, English. They, but they've still they got they a lot still, They're still developing. They've, they've obviously got the senior twins who, who have come through in, in recent years. Ollie Russell. One of them's think. gone out to Wakefield, hasn't he? Yeah. I don't know. Right, senior, I, I think, has gone to Wakefield. Right, right. Um, Obviously, Dom Young was signed for Newcastle Knights in the NRL uh, ahead of next season. Uh, Ollie Russell is a great young halfback, I think. Uh, I, really, I really enjoy watching him play. He's got a great kicking game. He's got the confidence of, of an halfback as well. I, I, I think they've got a good blend of youth and experience. It's interesting they play all that so we're talking about this now because I remember doing Magic Weekend last year and they, they, they beat Hull 55-2 yeah. or something like that. And that was the first game where I'd seen Huddersfield and I thought, I don't see Hull were bad, but you know, we had a lot of players, um, you know, McIntosh played well and a lot that was the first game, that was almost like the um what's the word? That was almost like the the first time you saw them put together what they maybe might be capable of. Um we're talking about Hull, so obviously they've had a couple of weeks off due to the, the COVID situation and sort of Things couldn't get much worse for Hull really this season. They had a poor start, they sacked the Colts, they had lockdown, they caught coronavirus, they got absolutely snotted when they played uh, Salford. It can't, it's, well, I mean, is it the only way is up from here? I think, Hull? well, I think so. Uh, I, I don't think matters could get much worse, could it? Be, uh, considering the circumstances over the last couple of weeks and, and how they, they finished before the the super well before the lockdown, sorry. Um, I think they've they've got the squad to to be successful. On on when you look at the the whole squad on paper, uh, the squad numbers that is more than capable of winning trophies. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Um, I mean, the, I suppose I it's, just, it's just about it's just about reaching them finals for Hull. The, um, the thing is with the with the with the, the table now. Yeah, the way, with the table now, is they're, they're, they're going to end up playing 20 games in total. Hull have played eight, but they're only four points behind second place. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, you know, it's been a bit of a, a disastrous 2020 for them, but string a few wins together, and they're more, it's top five, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They're in top five, so, I mean, they're only two points off, ironically, Huddersfield, uh, uh, who they play this weekend. So, all is not lost for Hull. Do you think they'll stick with Andy last for this season, at least? Yeah, I... I think they should give it, I think they will. It's probably a difficult time should. to recruit a coach. Exactly, so. exactly. Um, I think I think they should. I think he, that's what he deserves the season, at least. Uh, I think he deserves a shot there. Um, but yeah, just, yeah, I think he does. I think he does deserve uh, the shot of the season, at least. Uh, and then the final match, what a home game, I suppose, for Warrington to play Wakefield on Sunday. Now, there's a little bit of, obviously, we're based in Warrington, so we hear a few murmurs and stuff. There's a little bit of discontent at, at Warrington about the style of rugby that they play. And, um, you know, some of the fans aren't happy that the team that they've got on paper should be playing um, what they perceive to be better rugby. I'd counteract that and say, ultimately, 
it's a it's a it's a results business and it actually is better for Steve Price that they can grind out wins like they did against Huddersfield in the last game um, and stay there or thereabouts. Well, it's a, it's exact. We've seen we we witnessed this exact situation at Wigan under Sean Wayne. That some of the fans were unhappy with the way that Wigan were playing under Sean Wayne. It was very structured the way the Warriors played. They didn't throw the ball around. But at the end of the day, they won titles. They won Challenge Cup, they won Super League Grand Finals, they, all, they, they won big derby matches against St. Helens and Warrington. They were successful as a whole, yet some of the fans were still unhappy with how it was played. How it was played. Ra rather than you could play great rugby and not win any titles at all. You know, like you say, I mean, if, if Warrington win the Grand Final playing ugly rugby, that's surely better than, than not winning the Grand Final and trying to play nice rugby. I mean, there's a little bit of the argument, like, are they, you know, are they thinking, because we spend so much money, obviously, we've got Widdop in and Blake Austin's there, and obviously English is coming next season, that it should be more about winning, but at the same time, I go back to what I said before about OKR, it's, yeah, it's an entertainment business, but it's, it, it's about winning, and I think, have Warrington fans got a bit complacent, a bit, not greedy, but because they're so used to winning, they're a bit like, well, we want to win with style, but then at the same time, you've still not won that yeah. big, um, that that big trophy. So they're, they're the five games. Um, there's loads of sort of championship renewals going on, so keep an eye out on on the site for all them. Um, Ottawa are signing players for League One. I'll have a little bit of a chat about Ottawa. So um, I I I. I I spoke, I spoke to a few people about this, so a lot of clubs um, in, some of the League One clubs have expressed a little bit of discontent about the Ottawa situation, of course the Toronto situation doesn't help because everyone's wondering well, what's going to happen with that, um, I believe a lot of clubs have asked for clarity over travel, accommodation, how it's going to be, you know, what happens if someone catches coronavirus, one of the suggestions I think was that all the flights are going to be from Heathrow to Ottawa and there was a bit of worry that obviously there's going to have to be the travel there and back and basically there's, there was a movement, shall we say, to try and prevent Ottawa from playing. Apparently that's being shot down and, and there's been, th not threats, but ultimately Ottawa have got a participation agreement for 2021 and they plan on playing um, and any attempt to prevent them from playing will will result in legal discord, shall we say. There's a bit of murmuring that Ottawa won't play in Canada. Um, we, you know, I understand that they've they've already sounded out or they've already got an agreement in principle to play at Lee. Um, I, I'm, I mean, obviously I've made my position on this this clear, but it's a bit of a it's a bit of a funny one to be trying to expand and bring Ottawa into League One when we've still got this big grey cloud over Toronto. Yeah. Um... I think it's a tough situation for Ottawa. They seem a lot more structured and grounded than what Toronto were uh, in 2017. Uh, I will give Ottawa that. Um, and they've said that they want to have m the majority of the squad being Canadian born players. Well, that's not bad. Uh, and they've not signed a Canadian player yet. You sound like a witness. Uh, witness. <laughs> they've, 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 they've signed a, a strong witness contingent. Uh, they've, well, no, they've, they've, they've signed the majority of Northern Bears players. Uh, There's obviously an issue. They've not announced the, the signing of one uh, Canadian or USA international. Um, they've been very big on saying they've signed they, a Scotland international, they've signed an Ireland international. You know, they've been big on that, haven't they? And obviously, they, they've got a bit of a French connection there, and they've signed Louis Jouffre. Um, but the when the whole the whole franchise was first starting off, they, they were very keen that it was going to be it's going to be a Canadian franchise. They're going to have Canadian born players, and not, and they are doing trials to to get some Canadian players into the squad. I don't know how, how many games they'll play. Does it, does it, I mean, I've seen someone tweet us, didn't they? Um, I think he was, uh, was he English born or was he, 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 was, he, he was born in England but has lived in Canada since he was two or three and he's quite keen to have a tryout with the Wolves, uh, sorry, with Ottawa. 
Um, there's a slight issue where I don't think bona fide Canadian players can get work permits to play over here. So if you were, you know, if you were born in Ottawa and have lived in Ottawa all your life and have got a Canadian passport, I do not believe that you'll be able to get a work permit to play rugby league pro in this country. That's just a home office regulation. Now, Whoops. obviously, if you were a Canadian that happened to have a British mother or you know had a British passport or you know similar to um, Rhys Jacks, I think he was Aussie, wasn't he? If you've got something that enables you to play over here, then it's slightly different. Um, but yeah, it just seems to me. I mean, I'm dubious of, of, of the whole situation anyway. But it is. It, it doesn't really. You can see why clubs are concerned mm -hmm. because at the moment it looks like Ottawa are just going down the same path as Toronto. And yeah, there was a pandemic. And, but ultimately, Toronto. There's still a massive question mark over what's going to happen with that. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it, how it pans out. I think they will be. A, I think they will be allowed to to play in twenty twenty one. But we'll, we'll just. And what about to... Toronto? Do you think Toronto will be back? Super League. It sounds like that's where it's heading. I think. I think they will be back. Um, and to be honest, I, I would give them the benefit of the doubt for for twenty twenty one because no one no one could see this coming that that's hit us in twenty twenty. Mm. I think it'd be unfair to to keep them out completely. Uh, I think I think they will be back, and I think I think they should be given another shot at Super League in twenty twenty one. Be interesting to see what sort of squad they have, because you'd imagine they'll you'd imagine there'll be players who leave as a result of what's happened this year. Um, yeah. They'll probably want players to leave to give them a bit of salary cap um, room. You know, Sonny Bill. It'd be surprising if someone takes over that can afford to take on Sonny Bill's wages, because that's obviously a massive. Yeah. Um, you know, a massive commitment. Uh, Louis goes back to the discussion what we were having on Warrington. He says, as a Warrington fan, we do play boring rugby, but that is what is being coached. It's all about resilience and being tough. Do you, I mean, I, I can't remember what I was talking to this about, but do you really watch many games and think they play nice rugby at the moment? I, and that's the thing, I don't, think well, it's, well, I don't think it's necessarily exclusive to Warrington, that situation. No, no I don't. Um, we had it a couple of years ago, didn't we, where there was a lot of buzz and Hyper and Cass, mm. all the classy Cass tag, and they, they were throwing it around. And, and to be fair, I think I think Castleford probably still are the most entertaining team. I, I like, I, to be fair, I like watching St. Helens as well. I think St. Helens uh, utilise Johnny Lomax and Lachlan Cleet brilliantly. Uh, it comes with this, I just think that the, the nature of the game in the last five or six years it's has changed, just meant yeah. that it, that's the way it is. Because every, everyone's an athlete now. Yeah. Uh, even the the prop forwards are athletes. Uh, the fitter than ever before. They're, they're almost like machines and robots, aren't they? The, some of the players that are fit these days. Um, I think I just think rugby league's changed in general. Obviously, look over in, in Australia in the NRL. Everyone's an athlete there. It's it's a completely different game to what it was maybe. 15 to 20 years ago. A final point before we go, um, we had a mailbox this week, if you want to send us a mailbox you can do so via Facebook or email it in to us. Um, from a fan who basically said, Sean Wayne, England coach Sean Wayne, can't be that happy that there's no scrums over here when they've got scrums in Australia. Um, he's thinking about the World Cup, is it going to be weird for players playing with no scrums? We don't know whether it'll permanently be, in, you know, whether it'll be permanently um, implemented or if we'll go back to having scrums next season mm -hmm. but it does, it does provide an interesting point in terms of how how much is the different rules we have over here and in the NRL how much does that impact England when it comes to playing international rules I'm not sure it impacts impacts England that much um, but I'll wrap this up quickly we should just have one set of rules <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's it uh, <laughs> Louis also just adds that last time War Warrington uh, threw the ball around uh, was when Chris Sander was at half back Mm, maybe. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what triggers you to want to have that philosophy. Is it having one player, or is it having, is it the coach, or is it the the collection of players? Obviously, there's a core part of that Warrington team that's been the same for quite a while. Um, but we'll see what happens. So, um, five games back this weekend. Thanks as always to Betfred, and thanks to you for tuning in. We'll put it on YouTube and on the website as well if you. Just join us and you want to re-watch. Give us a comment as well. Yeah, thanks to thanks to Betfred, like I say, as usual. Please make sure you check out lovefulbelly.com for all the latest and we'll see you next week.